let's label the slots here in this local variable table. This was always a bit indirect to figure out what it actually meant. And you can just write the names there, it's not so hard. So let's say this here I said 0 is the first argument, so this is actually n. So we said sum 1 to n of 2. The second thing here, how do we figure out what that was again? Well, we go into our bytecode and you look for a variable index 1. So if you go here, we see ones showing up at different places. For example, I store 1. So if we store something into 1, then that must be a local variable. And what do we store in there? The 0. So which local variable in the source code did we store a 0 into? Yeah, here, sum equals 0. So this local variable number 1 must be sum. And now we get to the last local variable 2. You can again, again go through this list and you see I store 2. Right before it we said I const 1. So we put the value 1 in local variable 2. Which local variable do we store the value 1 in? Yep, I. Say so I equals 1 at some point. So this is I. So that's how we can reverse engineer what actually the different local variable numbers correspond to. Now this mapping from low-level artifact to high-level artifact is something that is quite important in a virtual machine. For example, when you have a debugger, you may ask the running virtual machine, tell me what right now the value is of local variable i. But the virtual machine has just numbers, so how does it know where i is? It needs to keep or maintain a map of this. So when you compile a method, there will be some extra information, some debug information that tells us that local variable 2 is actually called i. There are other cases in which this kind of debug information must be maintained. For example, when you're running your program in Java and an exception is thrown and it's not caught. You get a stack dump, stack trace on the command line. Stack trace shows you exactly where in your source code you were when the problem happened. Now if you look here, here it doesn't say anything about which source file and which line number. You only have a bytecode index. So somewhere there is a mapping from bytecode indices to source files and the line numbers those things correspond to. So that's maintained by the compiler. And there are other kind of meta information stored in the virtual machine while it's executing. For example, when you have a pointer to an object or a reference to an object in the heap, then you can ask what's the type of this thing? So what's the class? In Java you can call get class and you get back something. So all this information which is accessible in Java through reflection is stored somewhere also. And it's used actually, for example, for type safety. So if you do a cast and say, okay, here is an object and I cast this into a student, you have to be sure at runtime that this indeed is a student. And if it's not, you have to throw an exception. So somewhere you have to have this meta information. So a large amount of the work you do in the compiler is to maintain this meta information also. The last thing I wanted to say about this slide here is the operand stack and the local variable table, they're two pieces of memory that are related to this method here. And whenever a thread executes this method, those two pieces of memory are allocated, are used, and when the method returns, they can be freed. And I'm sure you know where such temporary information that's tied to a activation of a method is stored. It's an activation record or a stack frame of the call stack. So those two things actually live on the call stack. So on the call stack, which is a stack of activation records, in each activation records you have a little stack, the operand stack, and a local variable table. And they're adjacent, so it usually starts with the local variables, and on top of the local variables sits the operand stack, because the operand stack shrinks and grows, and the number of local variables is fixed can determine that statically. 